Hi, this is Carolyn here. I'm going to wait a couple of minutes to see if anyone comes in. And in the meantime, I will stare at you like this, dramatically. <laughs> no, I'm here because I am angry about something I read. I'm in a lot of groups for people with speech problems, aphasia, uh, neurological recovery. And I just really needed to get this off my chest. So if anyone's actually out there, if you could write a comment, I want to make sure this is going live. And it's um, something I haven't done before. I did it once with someone helping me. So I haven't really streamed live before. So it's very hard for me to tell if anyone is there. But I guess it can always be a replay, right? So first off, I don't know about everybody else, but I am seriously having cabin fever and I cannot believe how long I've been in my house. And hi, Melissa. Oh, thank you so much for letting me know you're here. And Larice, okay, great. I didn't even know if it was working. <laughs> so I was like, am I talking to myself? Um, while we're waiting for other people to come in, though, hi, Brad, hey, now. Um, a lot of you must be feeling like this. If I can't be the only one who's been sitting in the house for so long and is tired of my own four walls, um, just, like, beyond. So last night, I couldn't sleep. It was not even late. I mean, when I was young, I would go out then at 11. But I was awake and I was like singing, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored in every bad musical style that I could think of. And so, of course, when I'm like that, I turn to things like social media and the news and YouTube and all these different things. And I read something that made me mad, very mad. <laughs> um, it was about aphasia. And... I feel like, I know, Brad, you, you guys, a lot of you here have had aphasia, have aphasia, or know someone who has aphasia, and some of the assumptions that are made out there drive me crazy, and I'm sure they drive you crazy too, but what I have to keep reminding myself is that there's always new people who are coming into our community, right? So even though many of you guys have heard about um, the myths of aphasia and how they don't really, they're not right. So like we hear all the time, you know, you're never going to speak again. You're never going to walk again. And you guys are out there walking and talking, right? But there's new people being welcomed into our community every day. I know Nobody wants to have to join the community, but once you're here, you should get good information. And so I saw a post in a group, I forget which group, and basically it was from a daughter whose father had just had a stroke a couple of weeks ago. She was looking for support and she was feeling like nobody was giving her any hope I mean, that's got to be the worst feeling. I know Paul has talked about that, how like his doctor said there's going to be no speech. And we all know Paul is speaking great. He threw a pencil at that guy. He deserved it too. But think about the people who are coming into the community and those are the doctors they're hearing from. Not everyone finds people who believe in them or who tell them the truth that yes you can get better but you have to work and tell you what kinds of things to do to work so beyond that post the one that really made me mad was this woman again her father had had a stroke you guys are not going to believe this one so she's been going and taking her father to the speech pathologist supposed expert right and this woman said, well, it's been a year now. Your father's not going to improve anymore. What? 
That is so not true. And here's the worst part. The daughter knew that. She said to the speech pathologist, she said, people can keep getting better after a year. You guys know that, right? People can keep getting better after a year. Hey, Jerry, I'm just really angry and cabin fevered up and I just had to express myself here, so I'm just laying it out. Thank you for joining me. Anyway, so I was telling um, everyone that, you know, I read this post last night and a daughter um, was taking her father to speech therapy for a year for his aphasia and the speech therapist was ready to completely dismiss him because it's been a year and after a year you don't make any progress is what she said to the daughter that's not true we all know that's not true you need to keep working but you can keep getting better for the rest of your life I mean you guys met Sharon Antonucci she was my mentor um, Paul interviewed her the other day. She and I have worked with people 15, 20 years after a stroke who never had speech therapy and they got better. They improved, they got more words, more sentences, the sentence length increased, they understood more. So this daughter says to that speech pathologist, she says, people can still improve speech pathologist. And the speech pathologist said, if you can show me evidence, then I'll continue to see your father. Wait, what? The speech pathologist wanted the daughter to do research for her. Let's do your job. You prove to me that speech therapy can work after a year. That is ridiculous and so just completely offensive to me. <sighs> I'm like, my heart's pounding right now. I'm so angry. And my comment on this post was, you're better off without her. If she, the speech pathologist, doesn't believe your father's going to get better, he's not going to get better. How can someone who doesn't believe in you encourage you to do better? That, A, is the first thing. B, she's asking you on your own time while you're paying her to go do medical research, speech pathology research to show her there's evidence. Okay, for those of you who don't know, we have to do continuing education. Every year we have to do hours and hours of continuing education to remain speech pathologists. And if this woman doesn't know what she's doing, she can get continuing education. Okay, so that's point two. This is the third point, and I teach this. I teach at NYU as an adjunct professor. I've also taught at Mercy College in Dobbs Ferry, New York. I've taught at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut. I've taught at Long Island University in Long Island. <laughs> but I've taught at a number of places, and I'm teaching students who are graduate students so they already have their bachelor's degree they have their master's degree and I'm teaching them how to be speech pathologists that's one of the jobs I do I'm a professor and I always teach my students that to be ethical we have to know what we're doing if you don't know how to treat someone with aphasia if you don't know the basics about neural recovery processes and the time it takes to be invested into the recovery in order to see the improvements, you have no business treating that person with aphasia. So my message to people with aphasia and their family members is not all speech pathologists are experts at doing neurological rehab, aphasia recovery, cognitive recovery, and related things. Um, and so that's what I tell my students. I say, refer them to someone else. So this speech pathologist who said to this daughter, who's doing all the right things, said, I'll only do it if you show me it's worth it. That daughter needs to go to an expert, needs to go to someone who knows what they're doing, who believes in them. How can that father benefit if 
I'm sorry, somebody's calling me and I don't mean for that to happen. Yeah, Jerry, right. That's what I'm saying. Kick them to the curb and find a new one. Speech pathologists learn a lot of things. I mean, we learn the lifespan, right? We can we can work in like a NICU with babies who can't latch on, can't feed, have cleft palates or other oral facial issues that make it hard for them to breathe or to swallow. We can work, you know, in hospitals. We can work in schools. We can work in all different situations with kids with autism, with just articulation disorders, um, you name it. We're learn we are taught and we learn to do all of that. But once you start to practice, you can't be great at everything. And for a long time, I was a generalist because I worked in a big hospital in Manhattan and I saw everything, voice, fluency, um, swallowing problems. I did modified barium swallows. I had oral cancer patients. Like pretty much I got to see the whole field, dementia, um, end of life care, palliative care, um, recommending tube feedings and working with people on ventilators and neuro step down units. And I've done everything. And then I came and I narrowed down my field to aphasia. And so I don't know why this person is so insistent on talking to me. I am not talking to them, I'm talking to you guys. And um, I love it. Thank you, you guys. You see why I'm so upset. Um, oh my God, this person's addicted to me. Oh, can't they get the hint? <laughs> so, oh Lord. So, okay, no such thing as plateauing, Jerry. Yes, absolutely. And that's a myth. Plateau is a myth. This is another thing I say to my students. If you hit a plateau with a patient, that means you don't have enough tricks in your bag. It's time to get new tricks, new bag of tricks, or it's time for that client to leave you and go to another speech pathologist. And every once in a while, maybe it's good to get a new set of eyes on your case anyway. Um, so let me see what you guys have said. I'm just babbling because I'm so upset. Um, okay. Oh my God. I don't know how to block this guy. I'm on a live. I can't. Now you guys know why this is so outside of my comfort zone. I'm terrible at it. Okay. So let me see what you guys said. Okay, Melissa, you had to keep on Ken's team to get the speech person to come in. I only knew to do this because my mom had it when she was a heart attack stroke patient. Okay, so you had experience, right? Think about all the people who come in and they just believe what they're told because they don't have experience. That's scary to me. I, I am very passionate about this, Debbie, you're right because there's nothing more important that I can imagine as a human being than being able to communicate. And if someone robs you of your hope and the realistic notion that you can get better, uh, why would you think you could? The expert told you you can't. Melissa, your primary told Ken he doesn't need to see a neurologist because it's been two years unless something has happened. Well, that sounds like something to celebrate. As long as they know what caused the stroke and they're keeping an eye on making sure it doesn't happen again, that's great news and congratulations. Yeah, Jerry, that's what I'm saying. Kick him to the curb. Oh, your wife canned your speech pathologist because she didn't believe in you? And that was only after six months of no talking. And now you're, you're like, you sound amazing. Jerry, that's wonderful. Yes. Yes, Brad, switch doctors, see another doctor. Larice, you guys are with me. Oh, and look at Paul, right? Work hard, work hard. I'm not going to belabor this. I just, have, I was so upset. <laughs> I just was like, I want you guys to know, and I want it to spread around to like the newer people in the community, not to give your hope to someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, 
not all speech pathologists know and that's okay we can't all know everything you like you probably wouldn't say, send a kid who stutters to me i would not do a great job not on purpose not because i don't want to help but because i don't know enough about that it's too broad a field um so there are people who specialize in aphasia um there are people who specialize in neurorehabilitation. I've done many, many things with neurorehabilitation. For those of you who don't know, my doctoral dissertation was on using transcranial direct current stimulation over the brains of people who had neurological injury. And that was coupled with occupational therapy, moving the right arm, because most people who have aphasia have had a left-sided stroke, and so their right side may not work. And in the brain, the areas responsible for moving your arm and for talking are right next to each other. So a lot of times they can both be affected by whatever arterial problem there is. So if you didn't get blood flow to the part of your brain that does language, you may get aphasia and next door you may get arm difficulties. So um, that is something that I did a big study on for my dissertation. And the biggest thing I found, you guys, this is trade secret, is using your right arm, and Salud talks about this a lot, right? Using your right arm and use, crossing midline is really good for the left side of your brain. And if you do right arm exercises and speaking together or like close to each other in time, um, you'll get more benefit in that area of the brain because you're using um, the right-sided arm to stimulate the same area of the brain that you're stimulating when you want to do talking. So Michelle, do you have a question about a barium swallow? Because yes, I've done a zillion million of those as well. Did you have swallowing problems? Anyway, I just wanted to get on here and tell you guys, I believe in your recoveries. I want new people to hear that recovery is possible way beyond a year. I want you to switch therapists if you're not getting what you need. And I also really don't want you to be working with a speech pathologist who doesn't believe in, your, in the recovery process or doesn't know how to access it. Hi, Janice. Great to see you. I was riled up. You'll have to watch my replay. <laughs> Thank you guys for supporting me. I, um, I'm i here to support you, really, and I, I just really had to get that off my chest. And thank you for coming to my impromptu live. I might do, do these now and again because I'm trying to get more um, comfortable doing lives. I'm good when somebody interviews me, like Paul or something. He keeps me calm and comfortable. <laughs> what did you say, Melissa? You think the hospitals need to... Educate. Yes, those administrators don't know. Yes. In fact, I think Tom Broussard talked about this recently, right? He said, um, he said that hospital administrators and hospital, um, like large overarching hospital overseers, the big, you know, players in the game, they don't know that much about aphasia and neurological recovery. Like a lot of times if you look on websites for hospitals, they don't even list like aphasia therapy as something that they offer. So the, these things need to change, of course. So Larissa, can empty cell or pineal, pineal gland cyst cause speech changes? So I don't know what empty cell it is. I'll have to look that one up. Pineal gland cyst, I'm going to say, um, since the pineal gland is located so central in the brain, um, depending on like how enlarged the cyst becomes, I think that it could affect some other midline structures that could then push or um, like disrupt parts of the brain that would affect speech. But I have to look more into that condition and I will do that for you because I love you. <laughs> and I didn't know that they had found that with you. I'm assuming that's why you're asking because did that, did that, did you get a new diagnosis, Russ? Um, 
Oh, you guys are so welcome for... Of course I care. I'm glad John's listening, Janice. I hope he's not still sad about Snowy. Snowy was such a beautiful creature, such a soul. But Laura was right. What happened to his eyes and nose? Because, like, he was just twiggies there. Um, <laughs> all right. So I guess I'll see you guys uh, in the comments on Paul's video tomorrow or something. But um, tell John to find his center to eat. He doesn't listen to me. John, are you not hungry? Janice, is your food bad? I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you don't have a pituitary? I'll contact you, Larissa. It's got to be there somewhere. <laughs> um, anybody else have any brain questions? <laughs> the cat got them. Janice, you're so funny. Oh, so Michelle Renee, were you, you were asking about... Um, the barium swallow, it's a test we use that's basically a video x-ray of watching the food go down. So we can see um, anything that goes wrong in any of the several parts of the swallow. We can see if there's any chewing or oral phase problems, preparation of the food into like a little ball we call a bolus that can then be sent back. Then we can see what happens. There's a lot of cavities in here. In the pharynx, in the back of your throat, there's several places where food can get stuck or caught. And there's also um, a valve there that keeps the food from going into your trachea because you don't want food going into your lungs. So you want to make sure the food's going into the um, esophagus. Um, and we can pull down and see the esophagus, but that's really out of the scope of the speech pathologist practice. We're basically here to here, but... Um, if you have more specific questions, we can just see the whole swallow and see if you're in danger of aspirating, penetrating, or choking. So, um, so Jerry, um, when you're interviewing someone with aphasia, you were told to let them try to figure out the right words to say for at least three times. Um, who, somebody in our community always says that. Um, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about that. I think it depends on the individual person with aphasia. So some people might um, benefit, of course, from that extra time to try to get the word out. And I encourage that greatly. But if someone's uncomfortable and they want your help, um, you can set up in advance, like just, you know, that they could indicate to you that they want the help, especially in an interview when they may be feeling nervous or anxious. I mean, I am right now even. Um, but in therapy, I probably wouldn't rush to give somebody the word because the more work that the person's brain does, the more um, they'll be able to build the new circuitry for finding those words in the future themselves. Um, Yes, depending on the person and for different reasons. So I think if you exercise while using using your right hand while talking, um, that will help. And the way I would first do that is trying to use gestures. Um, if your right arm is weak for some reason, you can use, which is my right, this is my right. I was doing everything backwards. Oh my God, fire me. So if you had the left-sided brain stroke, which is what I meant to say before, and the right-sided weakness, you can use your left hand to help your right hand. Um, I'm a very gestural person, so um, I think starting to do that would be really good. And starting to use your right hand for as many things as you possibly can helps. You don't have to do them exactly at the same time, but let's say um, you're talking with someone you could, you know, try to gesture or you could just move your hand around. Like, it doesn't have to be like big, huge movements like I tend to do. <laughs> but um, is an EGD typically used as a diagnostic tool in speech? No. Mm -mm. But I can definitely look it up 
and see what that is. So John has his speech back pretty quick. Uh, reading and writing are still difficult. Is that something that bothers him, Janice? If he wants to work on that, that's something he could work on. But um, is he just not hungry or he's not able to eat fast enough? We'll have to talk about that more because it sounds like uh, there's some stuff that maybe we could help you with. Um, okay, anyway, I'm so glad you guys came in and just let me vent and tell you guys what I was thinking. I really want people to be educated about speech therapy, what's possible, what's not possible, um, and basically in the what's not possible category, there's not much. So may never be perfect, but it's gonna get a lot better than where it is. And we don't give up. We just keep working at it and it will come back. You just have to work. Um, so I will see you guys soon. And I feel like I was very scattered today, so I apologize. Um, but you guys, thank you for being here and listening. Yeah, nothing's impossible, Janice, right? And don't listen to people who tell you otherwise. It may not be perfect, but it'll be a lot better. We don't give up, right, Michelle? All right. Thanks, guys. I'm going to sign off now. Have a good day.